and welcome to this Good Friday worship service at Mount Olive Lutheran Church in Bay City, Michigan. All that you need for the service will be projected for you on the screen. We begin. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please join me in a responsive reading of Psalm 6. Please respond at home with the second half of each of the verses. O Lord, do not rebuke me in your anger. Do not discipline me in your wrath. Be merciful to me, Lord, for I am fading away. Heal me, Lord, for my bones are trembling. My soul is terrified. How long, O Lord, how long? Turn, O Lord, and deliver my soul. Save me because of your mercy. For in death no one remembers you. In the grave who praises you? I am worn out from groaning. I flood my bed all night long. With my tears I drench my couch. My eyes are blurred with sorrow. They are worn out because of all my foes. O Lord, our hearts are weighed down in sin. On our own merits we cannot stand. Yet through the sacrifice of your Son Jesus, you have given hope to all people. With you there is forgiveness. With you there is unfailing love and full redemption. Hear us now as we confess our sins to you in silent prayer and show us your mercy. Turn away from me, all you evildoers, because the Lord has heard the sound of my weeping. The Lord has heard my cry for mercy. The Lord accepts my prayer. They will be put to shame. All my enemies will be terrified. They will turn back. They will be put to shame in an instant. We gather around God's Word on this Good Friday. The message rings clear. Look, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. Look, my servant will succeed. He will rise. He will be lifted up. He will be highly exalted. Just as many were appalled at him, his appearance was so disfigured that he did not look like a man, and his form was disfigured more than any other person. So he will sprinkle many nations, and kings will shut their mouths because of him, because they will see something they had never been told before, and they will understand something they had never heard before. Who has believed our report, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot, and like a root from dry ground. He had no attractiveness and no majesty. When we saw him, nothing about his appearance made us desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man who knew grief, who was well acquainted with suffering. Like someone whom people cannot bear to look at, he was despised, and we thought nothing of him. Surely he was taking up our weaknesses, and he was carrying our sufferings. We thought it was because of God that he was stricken, smitten, and afflicted. But it was because of our rebellion that he was pierced. He was crushed for the guilt our sins deserved. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all have gone astray like sheep. Each of us has turned to his own way. But the Lord has charged all our guilt to him. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb he was led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that is silent in front of its shearers, he did not open his mouth. He was taken away without a fair trial and without justice, and of his generation, who even cared? So he was cut off from the land of the living. He was struck because of the rebellion of my people. They would have assigned him a grave with the wicked, but he was given a grave with the rich in his death, because he had done no violence, and no deceit was in his mouth. 
Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and to allow him to suffer. Because you made his life a guilt offering, he will see offspring. He will prolong his days, and the Lord's gracious plan will succeed in his hand. After his soul experiences anguish, he will see the light of life. He will provide satisfaction. Through their knowledge of him, my just servant will justify the many, for he himself carried their guilt. Therefore I will give him an allotment among the great, and with the strong he will share plunder, because he poured out his life to death, and he let himself be counted with rebellious sinners. He himself carried the sin of many, and he intercedes for the rebels. This is God's word. for this Good Friday is the Gospel of John, chapter 19. Carrying his own cross, he went out to what is called the place of a skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. There they crucified him with two others, one on each side and Jesus in the middle. Pilate also had a notice written and fastened on the cross. It read, Jesus the Nazarene, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this notice because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Aramaic, Latin, and Greek. So the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but that this man said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts, one part for each soldier. 
They also took his tunic, which was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. So they said to one another, let's not tear it. Instead, let's cast lots to see who gets it. This was so that the scripture might be fulfilled, which says, they divided my garments among them and cast lots for my clothing. So the soldiers did these things. Jesus' mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene were standing near the cross. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that time, this disciple took her into his own home. After this, knowing that everything had now been finished, and to fulfill the scripture, Jesus said, I thirst. A jar full of sour wine was sitting there, so they put a sponge soaked in sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. Then bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. The Gospel of our Lord. The Word of God that serves as the meditation for our sermon tonight is from the book of Hebrews, chapter 7. This is certainly the kind of high priest we needed, one who is holy, innocent, pure, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. Unlike the other high priests, he does not need to offer sacrifices on a daily basis, first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people. In fact, he sacrificed for sins once and for all when he offered himself. For the law appoints as high priests men who have weaknesses, but the word of the oath, which came after the law, appointed the Son, who has been brought to his goal forever. This is God's word. Dear friends, this is the end. There's no turning back now. The final showdown will decide everything, once and for all. Many books, TV shows, and movies lead to a climax such as that one. The hope is that the characters that we've been introduced to, the characters we've invested so much time in, the characters that we sympathize with, they will finally triumph over all provided there are no unforeseen plot twists. As we look at the scriptures before us tonight, we see that it is God himself who desires to comfort and assure us about once for all. Jesus is appointed. You are accepted. The writer to the Hebrews paints a very vivid picture for his Jewish audience. A picture that they're all too familiar with. A picture that began since the time of Moses. God, in his covenant at Mount Sinai, had established for his people a very regimented worship system that was led by a high priest. This high priest, selected from among the tribe of Levi, from among the people, would be their representative before God. He would give prayers, give gifts, offer sacrifices for sin, for himself, and for the people he represented. And beginning with that first high priest, Aaron, that pattern didn't change. The high priest would first cleanse himself according to the ceremonial washings that were required of him. And then, after that was complete, he would offer a sacrifice for his own sin. And then another sacrifice for the sins of the people. Day in and day out, over and over and over again. Can you imagine all the animals bleating, all the blood spilled on the altar. God was making a point with this worship system. Sin 
is serious. Sin is a problem. Sin caused separation between God and man. It needed to be fixed, and it required the shedding of blood. One other point God made clearly. No amount of animal blood could ever fix the problem. No high priest, no matter how pious or devout he was, could ever improve the situation for himself or for the people, because that high priest was himself infected with the very curse of sin. No, if there was going to be a solution for sin and its problem, that solution had to be by divine intervention. The purpose of God's law is rather sobering, isn't it? It stares right back at you and clearly, boldly, adamantly says, you can't do it. It's the reminder that Israel got day after day. It's the reminder that you and I need day after day as we live our lives in this world. You can't do it. Even though our sinful nature would have us think otherwise, the sinful nature that is programmed otherwise to say, I can, I can. I can be a good person. I can get along with others. I can do good works. I can, if I look deep, deep down inside of myself, I know I can change. I can, I can, I can. And God's law stares right back, unblinking, and says, you can't do it. None of us can. And so God had to appoint another high priest, a high priest that truly meets our need, one who is holy, blameless, pure, set apart from sinners, exalted above the heavens. Unlike the other high priests, he does not need to offer sacrifices day after day, first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people. God appointed Jesus his own son. Jesus, who did not need to offer any sacrifices for sin because he had none. Jesus, who perfectly obeyed and lived under God's holy will, who separated himself far and above from the rest of humanity. Jesus, who is our perfect high priest, became the perfect sacrifice before God, holy, pure, and blameless. He became that perfect sacrifice on Calvary. On that cross, he endured the torments of hell. He endured the insults, the pain, the abandonment, all for you and me. He, Jesus, sacrificed for sins once for all when he offered himself. Jesus is God's climax in the confrontation with sin and Satan, a climax that brought it all to an end. And at the same time, brought about a new beginning. For as Jesus was appointed, you are accepted. A change has taken place. The writer to the Hebrews says, for the law appoints as high priests men who are weak, 
But the oath which comes after the law appointed the Son, who has been made perfect forever, who has been brought to his goal. A change has taken place for New Testament believers. Because of what Messiah, because of what Christ has done, there is no need for sacrifice after sacrifice and high priest after high priest. The Levitical priesthood is out of a job. And as repetitious and temporary as that Levitical priesthood was, there is nothing more permanent than the oath that God gave and gave repeatedly. He swore this oath to King David and swore it again and again through the prophets like Isaiah and Jeremiah. He even swore it, promised it to our first parents, Adam and Eve, there in the garden as he spoke to the serpent. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. God said there would be a Savior. God appointed a Savior. And God accepts the payment of that Savior, through whom everything is made perfect. It's a change that you and I live in today by God's grace. I mean, we're not going to gather here again soon with a bunch of animal sacrifices, are we? We aren't preparing any such things, are we? You know, Lord, I just want to let you know that I'm being a good Christian today. I'm watching this Good Friday service. I'm sitting on my couch. I have it there on my TV screen or on my computer. And by the way, it's it's not even Sunday, I mean, it's Good Friday, so this has got to be extra, triple, double bonus points here. Just thought you should know that. Or you know, your grace, God, definitely for me, but I've got to let you know, I've been putting up with a lot lately from my co-workers, my friends, and my relatives about my Christianity. So you got to cut me some slack. Or, Lord, you know I'm a sinner. I know I'm a sinner. Have you seen what I've done lately? How can that be worthy of any grace that you should want to give to me? No, Lord, I've, I've got to do better. I've got to do better so that I can count myself worthy of the grace that you have given And you see, the sinful nature is added again. It's, if it's not trying to equalize and cancel out every one of our sins before God, then through guilt, it's trying to make us add to the mercy and grace of God that we have already been given and given freely. And that's when we need to look again at Calvary and the cross, and the perfect sacrifice of Jesus that is there, that covers everything, from our pompous arrogance to our deepest despair. Comfort comes from our lesson. Jesus sacrificed for sins once for all when he offered himself. These words simultaneously echo from the cross as Jesus says, It is finished. What God has declared done, no one can declare not done. So, what are you left to do? What can you do? Motivated by the Holy Spirit and the faith that is placed in you, you can love and serve your God 
as you were intended to. You can give him thanks and praise and gifts and bring glory to his name in everything that you do, not out of some lawful compulsion, some sacrificial compulsion that says, I must, but because you have a heart that overflows now with thankfulness because of everything that God has accomplished for you. You can approach God freely. You can approach Him and His throne of grace in prayer. You can call on His name in the day of trouble. You can trust every single one of His promises to you. Because you have a great high priest. You have Jesus through whose suffering and death you have been made perfect, holy, blameless, pure, and God-pleasing. My friends, no one could have thought this or dreamt this up in their mind's eye. Nobody could have captured this through the eye of a camera. God shows our weakness and our hopelessness against sin and then lifts up our eyes to gaze at the sacrifice that is there on Calvary, to gaze at his very own son, Jesus. And he says, you are forgiven. You are accepted because Jesus was appointed once for all. Amen. In response to the word of God we have heard, please join me in the responsive reading and the second half of each of the psalm verses from Psalm 22 and Psalm 16. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? My groaning does nothing to save me. My God, I call out by day, but you do not answer. I call out by night, but there is no relief for me. I am a worm and not a man, scorned by men and despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They sneer, they shake their heads. They say, trust in the Lord, let the Lord rescue him. Let him rescue him, if he delights in him. Like water I am poured out, all my bones are pulled apart. My heart has become like wax, it has melted in the middle of my chest. My strength is dried up like broken pottery, and my tongue is stuck to the roof of my mouth. You lay me in the dust of death. Dogs have surrounded me. A band of evil men has encircled me. They have pierced my hands and feet. I can count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them. For my clothing they cast lots. But you, O Lord, do not be distant. O my strength, come quickly to help me. Guard me, O God for I take refuge in you. I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore my heart is glad and my whole being rejoices. Even my flesh will dwell securely. Because you will not abandon my life to the grave, you will not let your favored one see decay. We bow our heads for prayer. Dear Savior Jesus Christ, with your triumphant cry of victory from the cross, you brought to a close your blessed work of redeeming us from our sins. Mortal tongues can never express all the praise due to you for this gift of your love, namely your body given into death and your blood shed for our sins. Oh, what joy! 
What hope, what comfort is ours in the midst of sin and affliction, knowing that our sins are forgiven and that we are redeemed through your sacrifice. May our hearts never stray from you, and may we never cease praising you. Sprinkle our sins with your blood and blot out our many transgressions from God's sight forever. As long as we live, shower us with your grace, bestowing every needful blessing upon our souls and bodies. It is in your name we pray, and that we join in praying. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Almighty and merciful Lord, full of wondrous and boundless love, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, bless and preserve you. It is finished. Amen.